Conservation of mass. What do I mean by that? Well, it's the idea, the principle, that mass cannot be created or destroyed in a chemical reaction. You'll notice that there's an asterisk at the end of this statement, and it goes on to say, it can't be created or destroyed, it can only change forms. Well, that is true. However, full disclosure requires me to tell you something very mysterious sounding. One of the forms that matter can take is energy, or perhaps more accurately, one of the forms that energy can take is matter. You can think of matter as being a scrunched together form of energy. But in any case, matter cannot be created or destroyed in chemical processes. Here we're going to introduce a conceptual model of matter, of mass, which is found on page 24 of your textbook. In this model, atoms are said to be composed of three particles, protons, neutrons, and electrons. Here the protons are represented as being relatively large and colored pink with a plus sign. The neutrons are a neutral dull blue color and electrons are bright green with a negative charge. Now, when we're talking about the properties of the atom, we are interested in charge and mass. Some of the particles have charge, some of the particles have mass. And nearly all of the atom's mass is found in the atomic nucleus, where positively charged protons, again shown in pink, and uncharged neutrons with a dull gray color are said to be bound together by the nuclear force. Electrons, meanwhile, are not found in the nucleus. These negatively charged particles, which are nearly massless, move rapidly around the nucleus in an area that they define, which we often call the electron cloud, or just the cloud. Now here on page 25, there's a huge amount of information that I want to make certain that students understand is really basic and fundamental to any chemistry course and thus should form a major part of any notes that you possess. When we talk about the model for these building blocks, protons, neutrons, and electrons, when we talk about them, I want to be very clear that we often talk in a way that is simplifying to the point of being almost fiction. But in point of fact, these simplifications don't mean that we're trying to lie to you. Instead, we're trying to make a model more intelligible because the fundamental fact is that down there, in the tiny, tiny, in the world of the atom. The rules are not the same down there inside the atom as they are in everyday life. And they certainly don't match our everyday life expectations. So having said that, let's dive in deeper. First thing we need to know is that, well, is really how many protons are there? That's really the first thing you need to know when you're talking about any particular element. When you're talking about a proton, you're talking about the particle that defines what kind of element it is. Under ordinary circumstances, you can't change the proton number for reasons we'll get to in a moment. But if you have three protons, well, then you're lithium. And as you can see right here uh, in this little box in the periodic table, we see that the, the number three is in the upper left-hand corner representing the atomic number which is the same thing as the number of protons, which really is the same thing as a particular element's identity. If you have three protons, you're lithium. If you have four, you're beryllium. If you have five, you're boron, six, carbon, and so on and so forth. Now, when we talk about the mass of the particles, we kind of cheat a little bit. We, for example, we pretend that protons and neutrons have exactly the same mass, which we call one atomic mass unit. But in point of fact, the neutron is ever so slightly heavier. And we often act as if the electron has no mass at all. We say it has zero atomic mass units and we ignore it. But that doesn't mean it isn't real. It's just that the mass of the electron most of the time is said to be negligible we can ne neglect or ignore that mass because it's so small, about 1,837 times smaller than either the proton or the neutron. As mentioned, it's very hard to change the proton number. That's because protons have a positive charge and 
So any attempt to move a proton in or move a proton out of the nucleus must overcome electrical forces of attraction from opposite particles and forces of repulsion from particles of the same charge. And there are a whole bunch of protons all closely together already in the nucleus being held together by the nuclear force. And so any attempt to move a proton in or out must overcome awesome energies. And those energies, well, they're too great to be overcome by the forces that we might find in everyday life. And so in everyday life, you don't see elements losing protons too often. But neutrons are an entirely different matter. The neutrons, again, shown with a kind of pale blue color, these neutrons are in fact neutral. They don't have a negative or a positive charge. And so the forces of repulsion that might tend to keep a proton in place have no bearing for a neutron. So it often happens that an atom is just minding its own business in free space and a free neutron collides with it and it just sticks. And then we end up with an atom with an extra piece of mass. And we call that kind of atom an isotope. When you have an extra heavy version of a standard atom, that extra heaviness, that extra mass comes from one or more extra neutrons. And we refer to those versions of atoms as isotopes. Now, just as we have versions, now just as we have versions of protons and neutrons not quite being the same, we also have versions of atoms that where the protons and electrons are not the same. We call these ions. Sometimes it happens that an atom will lose an electron. When it loses an electron, the positively charged protons in the nucleus pull more heavily than the electrons on the outer shells. And so the atom becomes smaller because the forces in the nucleus are pulling a little bit more. But the opposite can happen. For elements like fluorine or chlorine, they tend to gain an electron, and therefore the number of negative charges on the outer shells is greater than the positively charged protons in the nucleus. And so they pull more, and those atoms tend to be larger. Now, as a consequence, something interesting happens for the periodic table as a whole. One side tends to become cations. Cations are what we call positively charged ions. And you'll notice, if you look at the periodic table, you'll see that a whole bunch of rows are turning red, redder, and redder still. And they'll tend to be plus one, plus two, or plus three. On the opposite side, the anions, like fluorine and chlorine, the negatively charged particles, well, they do the same thing. And some of them tend to be minus one, minus two, or minus three. You'll also see, when we blow it up, you'll see that uh, there are two columns, 4A containing carbon and 8A containing the noble gases. They aren't colored at all. That's because they tend to be neutral. In the case of 4A, it's because the forces acting on them that would tend to, tend to push them positive or negative are about equal and they, they kind of strike a balance. And for the last column, 8A, it's just because they're completely full and happy with the structure of their, their interior and they don't need anything from anyone. And so, frankly, they're not very good neighbors and they don't really do chemistry very well, unlike many of the other elements. We'll have a lot more on that later. Now, when we're talking about chemical reactions, they occur in systems that are said to be open, closed, or isolated. And you'll see this on page 26 of your text. Open systems are the most common. They're the, they're the easiest to model. You see here a, a blue arrow going up and down. That represents matter. Perhaps you can pour more liquid in to fill up the beaker more. Or perhaps the liquid inside can evaporate and leave the beaker. But uh, matter is free to go in, free to go out. You also see red wavy lines. And these, in turn, represent energy perhaps going in, heat uh, coming in or out. And so we say that an open system uh, it is a system where the heat and matter are exchanged with the surroundings. Now, suppose we put a lid <laughs> on our open system. If so, it becomes, as you might expect, a closed system. And the lid would prevent any more liquid from getting in and any material from evaporating to some degree. But, of course, you see that the wavy lines in and out representing the motion of energy, that's still present. And so when we're talking about a closed system, we're talking about a system in which matter supposedly cannot be moved in or out, so it's conserved. 
but the heat, the ability of the heat to be exchanged is retained. Now in practice, virtually no closed system lasts all that long when compared to the life of the universe. And so you might question whether a closed system is something that nature will automatically maintain and whether it ultimately is as real as an open system. But we can identify or at least talk about a closed system and to the extent that we can talk about it, I guess it's real. And we have an isolated system. We imagine our beaker has a lid on it, but now it's surrounded by some kind of packaging that insulates and isolates it from the rest of the universe. And so uh, in this circumstance, uh, energy doesn't come in, energy doesn't go out, matter doesn't come in, matter doesn't go out. Nothing is exchanged. Well, there's really no such thing as a completely isolated system. Even if you're in the depths of interstellar space, uh, where you might encounter a grain of dust once in a million years. Nevertheless, sooner or later you'll encounter it, and that collision could lead to a transfer of energy. But whether it, was be, it would be big enough that anyone could measure, I suppose, is a philosophical question that, that we can't pursue here today. In any case, we have open, closed, and isolated systems, and uh, having that model gives us some handle on the question of where energy can go in, where matter can go in, and whether where one or both are discouraged from doing so. Well, here we have a very sad situation. Uh, the color of the truck is not, it's, it's not the intended color. The paint has all eroded. This color right here is actually the color of iron, which has been oxidized according to this equation, where four atoms of iron will uh, combine with three molecules of atmospheric oxygen and the product is two molecules of iron three oxide fe2 or three or as we might say rust the vehicle is rusting it's a chemical reaction that's happening that's going to tear it up and make it less interesting after a while well when we try to describe these reactions we can talk about the presence of uh, numbers in the equation we can talk about the presence of those numbers, and there are numbers in our front that are called coefficients, and there's numbers in the back and below called subscripts. And the reason the numbers are there is because we have to do a good job of bookkeeping if we're gonna describe the flow of mass, because the flow of mass described on page 28 is just the textbook's way of talking about keeping track of what the atoms are doing. And we, to do that, we use these chemical equations. And the key thing is, is that they must observe the principle of conservation of mass that I mentioned at the beginning of this video. How matter flows and how it is changed into different forms within chemical systems, we measure them with these equations, similar to the equations we see in algebra. These chemical equations observe the principle of mass conservation. And look carefully, look carefully indeed, because if you look at the equation, you'll see that there are four irons on both sides of the equation, and there are six oxygens on both sides as well. If mass conservation is going to be observed, and we're gonna follow that principle, then there should be equal amounts of each element on both sides of the equation before and after the reaction takes place. Now, when we talk about chemical reactions, some are hard to see. You know, some of them involve invisible and odorless colorless gases, and some of them involve tiny changes that don't seem to have anything happen for quite a bit of time. So in a high school chemistry classroom, we, uh, we have some troubles keeping track of chemical reactions. And so we tend to choose experiments that allow, it, allow us to be very clear that a reaction has happened. A reaction is a complicated thing. It's not just, you know, A meets B and something happens. There's actually an interaction when the iron molecules and the oxygen molecules are involved in the chemical reaction that leads to the rusting of the truck, why those iron and oxygen molecules, they are interacting with one another. They actually have to bump into each other in real time. And, uh, you know, electrons have to be moved around to form or break chemical bonds. It's complicated. But having said that, uh, a chemical reaction is simply an interaction between those substances. And it's one that doesn't just move atoms around, it rearranges the way they're put together. It changes the composition of matter. Well, that's what we mean when we talk about a chemical change.
Now, how can we tell chemical changes happen? Well, here we have a reaction, a little process where iodine is going from a solid to a, a gas, and it goes there directly without doing a, the liquid stage at all, a process called sublimation. And when this happens, well, you can kind of smell it. It's not the world's great smell, but more importantly, you can really see it. The dark iodine converts into a deep violet vapor, which is very easy to see, unlike many other gases, and uh, very obvious to affect your senses, because if you inhale it, you're inhaling something toxic. You don't want to do that. But it's really easy to see a change of that sort where gas is being produced. Another thing can, that can be fairly easy and dramatic is when something gets really hot or something gets really cold, and we can quantify that. We can use a thermometer, a temperature probe, to figure out how the temperature changes. And sometimes we have a reaction where heat is produced, and so the local environment gets way warmer, hot even. And sometimes we have a reaction that does the opposite, where the surroundings get colder, which means the reaction is actually sucking energy out of thin air, out of the environment. So that's good evidence of a chemical change. Now here we have a change in color. I really am fascinated by changes in color because they're really obvious and dramatic. And you might say, well, how does a chemical reaction make a change in color? I mean, you, I understand how it might, you know, give off a gas and sometimes we can see it or how it might give off energy and we can see something get hot. But how does a chemical reaction cause a color change? Here in this clock reaction, uh, which is looping over and over again, we definitely see that, but the question is, how does it happen? This is an interesting question. So I have here a couple of colored markers, and I also am wearing a very dark shirt. It's really easy to see the colored markers against the dark shirt. When we look at the shirt, what we're seeing is almost, there's almost no detail coming back on the video screen because light's not being reflected very much. That's why it's black to our eyes because most of the light is being absorbed. The molecules in this shirt have a shape that they tend to capture rather than reflect light. But our markers, why one's neon orange, one's neon yellow. They're very bright and especially against the background of the, of the black shirt, they're very easy to see. Why are they easy to see? Well, because they have molecules that really reflect light very well. And in fact, they this one really reflects a particular frequency or two around yellow, and this one reflects a frequency or two around orange very strongly. And so we perceive those as the dominant colors of these neon markers. So what's, what, what's, what's this all about? Well, in the illustration, in the video, What's going on here is that as the chemical reaction takes place, the molecules are actually changing shape. And as they change shape, they reflect light differently. And we see that as a color change. That's really kind of cool, very obvious uh, evidence of, a, of an actual chemical reaction. Now the other day, we did an experiment which uh, is, was designed to illustrate conservation of mass, which we've already mentioned. In that particular experiment, well, we didn't get a gas. So we, we didn't see a temperature change. We certainly didn't see a color change. But what we did see is we saw the appearance of a precipitate. In this experiment, in this experiment, uh, we mixed two clear fluids that didn't appear uh, to be anything much more than water. They looked like water, but of course they were actually solutions that we had dissolved different chemicals into. So they were solutions where those things were dissolved. And as long as they were dissolved, the substances in the beakers looked very clear. But the moment we mixed them, we saw a milky blue precipitate appear. And the precipitate is actually a substance that was dissolved, but because of the reaction, it can no longer stay dissolved. It becomes insoluble. So it comes out in the solution, and if, if we'd given it enough time in the lab, it, this powdery material would have collected on the bottom of our flask, and uh, we could have uh, perhaps scooped it up with a spoon. But we were in a hurry. We ran it through a filter to separate it to see the results. And so a precipitate, just like gas production, temperature, and the color changes, is a good sign of a chemical reaction. Now, when we're talking about chemical reactions, we want to be able to describe them with equations. 
And the first time a person sees chemical equations, they kind of look like this. They're kind of blurry, or at least our eyes kind of glaze over because it just looks like really unfamiliar math. I mean, it might be not so bad if it's familiar elements like hydrogen H or oxygen O, water H2O. But when we start seeing unfamiliar symbols, SR, AG, W, uh, it, it doesn't make a lot of sense to us. Plus, we see numbers in front and we see little numbers below and behind. And there's a bunch of numbers. It's really confusing looking. And so I wish I had a dollar for every time a student would say to me, Oh, Mr. Hatfield, this is, this is like a foreign language. And I love that comment because it really shows the kid is thinking. It really shows the person is really thinking about it. It's true. It is a foreign language. But it's a language that we can align up with our experience and with other ideas, and we can make sense of it. We just need to learn a few of the particulars. So let's take a look at them. Let's do that right now. You know, good news. For most of us, since most of us speak English or we speak uh, some other European derived language, those languages tend to all be read left to right. And so here, the chemical reaction is going to be read from left to right, from the blue side of the arrow to the red side of the arrow. The blue side is going to be behind the arrow that represents chemical change, and the red side will be uh, after the, the side that represents chemical change. And so we have reactants here. What's a reactant? Well, it's, it's a substance that reacts. Uh, these scientists with their clever names. Huh? The reactants are shown in blue on the left-hand side behind the arrow. The products, meanwhile, are shown in red. Uh, they are the substance produced in the reaction. That's why they're called products. Oh, those scientists with their names. But you'll find them after the arrow on the right-hand side and on this slide colored in red. Now, in between, we have an arrow, and the arrow represents chemical change, the moment of chemical change. It could be instantaneous. When we did our lab with the precipitate or when we burned the candle in the previous lab, those were pretty quick reactions. They began pretty quickly. So what the reaction, what does it say? It says, well, that A plus B were there before and then they react and then we get C plus D. Now, don't be deceived. No one is claiming that there's an element capital A or an element capital D here. Uh, there is capital B boron and capital C carbon, but none of these letters represent actual elements. They just represent the abstract idea. So A and B being in front of the arrow are reactants, and C and D afterwards are products. And the arrow is just chemical change. Now you might say, oh, well, so you, this happens, and we read it like a sentence to left to right, and then after we read it like that sentence in English, well, I, it's over, right? And everything got used up, and... We won't go backwards, we'll go on to the next sentence. Well, not quite. Again, we're simplifying. I'm giving you a simple picture to help you understand, but in point of fact, sometimes we don't use everything up. And sometimes a reaction is reversible. That is, it can go in the opposite direction, or maybe it can even go in both directions at once, uh, at the same time, rather. Uh, so if you, if you read this right here and you say, what, reversible? Well, notice we have a double arrow. The arrow on the top is going one direction, the arrow on the bottom is going in a different direction, but you know, the implication is that both could happen. Now, if that complexity scares you, don't worry about it right now. We're in the fall semester. You won't have to deal with all that complexity until the spring semester. But eventually we will deal with it and we'll have the tools to deal with it. Now, here's the part that really puzzles students. It's not the arrow and all that. A lot of that's intuitive, again, because we tend to read languages that work the same way, but it's the numbers. So we have some numbers here. Some numbers are called coefficients and the others are called subscripts. The so coefficients are the numbers in front. So when we say 2K, that means two potassiums. K is the symbol for potassium in the periodic table. And when we say 2KCl, we mean two potassium chloride molecules, because that's what KCl stands for. And the two in front just tells us that in that particular reaction, we need two of them. Two of one of the reactants and two of the product. But in addition to the coefficients, we also have subscripts. And subscripts are little numbers that are attached at the end. And so we have Cl with a little two after it. Well, what does that mean? Well, Cl is chlorine. And this simply means that you have two chlorines stuck together. Instead of a single chlorine atom, 
This is a chlorine molecule. Like hydrogen and oxygen, it tends to come in pairs, and we call those pairs diatomics. Now, other symbols can be added as well, and they usually appear in tiny little letters after a given substance to give you an additional piece of information. For example, there may be a reaction that uses water, but the, the water is only effective if it's really hot. So it wouldn't be, you know, an ice cube. It wouldn't even be liquid. It would be so hot that it was a vapor that it had gone into the gaseous state, steam. So maybe a reaction that, that did that with water, we'd have to specify that it was a gas. And so we put a little lowercase g after the symbol for water. Or if we needed a solid S or a liquid L. Uh, in our lab that we did with the precipitate, we made two solutions. And so in that particular situation, we might put a little AQ after that. And that little AQ stands for an old fashioned word, aqueous, which simply means hmm, dissolved in water. Finally, we have a triangle. A time will come, we won't just be talking about the conservation of matter and making sure our equations are balanced, but we'll also want our equations to tell us, hey, is energy going out or is it going in and how by how much? So in that case, we'll use a triangle to represent a change in heat energy so that number could be either positive or negative. Finally, and this can be very important in biochemistry, it often happens there are reactions that are very unlikely to happen. They require things to hit each other just the right way with just the right energy. And in those cases, to make those reactions a reality, we often employ a catalyst. A catalyst is a molecule, often fairly large, that has a shape that matches some of the uh, molecules that would interact in the reaction. It has a shape that facilitates, it makes reaction more likely to happen. And so we say that it increases the rate of the reaction because it has that shape. It tends to push the things we want to have come together, together. But it itself is not usually changed in the reaction. Even if you use it a million times, these molecules tend to be reusable. So in the case where a catalyst is really required to get anything real, underneath the arrow for chemical change, we might write the words, catalyst. Now let's interpret an actual reaction, an actual equation. Here we have, you know, an unknown number of hydrogen gas, H2, reacting with an unknown number of oxygen gas, O2, to form, you know, water. It's an equation for the formation of water. And I often might ask my students to write a paragraph that, you know, explains what every part of this equation represents. Now, looking at an equation and writing about it is pretty challenging. And so to help my students, I might give them some pictures. You see, we have a box here that uh, has H2. And we look at the box, we see there's little pairs of blue circles stuck together. And another reactant, O2, we have little pairs of slightly larger red circles stuck together, representing one of those. And then after the arrow, we got the product water. We see that the large uh, red and the two smaller blue have been rearranged to form groups of three. It, kind of look like Mickey Mouse. That's our little Mickey Mouse representation of a water molecule. So maybe with that picture, students would either would have a little bit more intuitive idea and they could write a paragraph with some detail saying what would happen to the hydrogens and oxygens. And they might even count them. They might say, oh, there's, there's six of the hydrogens. There's three of the oxygens. There's six of the waters. From that, they might infer something about the, the ratios that actually exist in this unbalanced equation. Yes, it is unbalanced. A careful look makes that clear. And to balance it, what are we going to need to do? We're going to need to put coefficients in there in some of the spaces to even out the number of hydrogen and oxygen atoms. And why do we have to do that? We got to do it not just because we're interested in bookkeeping. We do it because it's the law. We have to obey the physical laws. And again, the principle at work here is the, that of conservation of mass. The total number of each element on both sides of the equation, in this case, hydrogen and oxygen, the total number before and after each element must be the same in order to avoid violating conservation of mass. At the largest possible scale for the universe as a whole, the total amount of matter and energy is believed to be held constant. Equations must be balanced because mass is conserved.
all the mass, all the mass of all the moons and planets and stars, the solar systems, the galaxies, the gigantic superclusters formed from many galaxies together. All those, all of that, all that matter and more besides uh, must be held constant uh, along with the energy associated with it. Well, that's the law and it seems very philosophical and perhaps way too much to pressure to put on a high school student. Well, don't worry. We don't have to keep track of all the matter and energy in the universe. It's just an idea. But I want to make sure you understand it's an idea that applies to the universe as a whole. We can look at a local system, though, that's simpler. We can imagine someone cooking something on our stove, a gas stove that uses propane. The propane undergoes a chemical reaction where it reacts with oxygen. And in this reaction, if uh, it's complete combustion, if it's a new stove and the propane tank is well regulated, uh, it, you will get a lot of energy out. It'll be very efficient, and as a consequence, a lot of energy. The flame is hot. It's a brilliant blue. But if the oven is aging or there's something wrong with the tank or the connection or the regulation, then maybe not. Maybe you don't get a blue flame. Instead, you would get a yellowish or orange flame because that reaction would not be as efficient and you wouldn't get as much heat out. It's not as good a deal. But regardless, regardless of which reaction happens here, which combustion reaction happens, the total amount of carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen atoms before and after is the same. So even in a local system, no matter what the reaction is, conservation of mass, as in these combustion reactions, will be observed. Now, balancing equations, this is kind of an unpleasant part of the course. It's kind of like a little growth period. You have to go through a little pain, and I have no desire to cause you unnecessary pain, but I do have desire to cause necessary pain. You really do have to struggle with this and fight it and work on it to get better at it. I'm just going to tell you that right now. The reason it is a struggle is not because there's math or abstract symbols involved. The reason there's a struggle is because there's no easy automatic way to do every problem. If it was uh, like many of the things we learn to do in a math class, there's a little routine, a recipe, like what the mathematicians called an algorithm. A little set of instructions that if you follow it, it's guaranteed to lead you to the right answer. Well, there really isn't a simple cookbook method guaranteed to lead you to the right answer. It's not that kind of thing. Just because you can do it in a math class doesn't mean nature has to agree. Sometimes you have to just do things the way nature has it. This is what you call an iterative procedure. Mathematicians use that word basically to mean, hey, it's trial and error. We try this thing, and if it doesn't work, we try something else. That doesn't work, we try this thing. And you're probably thinking, that's, that's kind of a stupid way to do this, isn't it? <laughs> it really isn't a very smart way to do this. Interestingly enough, it is a way that a lot of computers do a lot of their work. Uh, computers aren't smarter than people. Uh, what computers are is they're just very fast at doing calculations. And so there are a lot of computer programs that the, the computer program isn't very elegantly written at all. It doesn't really have an algorithm that will allow it to do anything quickly. Instead, the computer just keeps trying numbers until a number works. And a computer might do this rapidly. It might do a million, 10 million, maybe even a, as many as 100 million calculations per second on some of your more powerful personal computers. But it's just doing trial and error. It's just quickly plugging in a bunch of numbers until one works. And we just think it's smart because it seems like it, it comes up with the answer instantly. And we just don't see the millions of times it tried all the wrong answers. Well, I don't know if that's encouraging. Don't worry, you won't have to try millions of times or even dozens of times. You're in a position kind of like a small child playing with a very familiar toy. That toy is the set of plastic or wooden colorful blocks that has geometric shapes on it that will fit into a box or a, perhaps a bench with matching shapes. And small children are fascinated by this toy because, you know, you put it in front of them, they see that the pieces fit, but they don't really understand why because their brains haven't learned to, to, to associate colors and shapes and recognize how one shape matches another. And so they'll play with it and they'll just move the pieces in and out. Hey, maybe if you were like me as a small child, you'd take the hammer and you'd try to push the square peg into the round hole and push it through. Well, um, could be bad. But in any case, the, the small child will be very fascinated. We'll keep doing this because it doesn't understand the pattern. It just knows that there's some puzzle that's interesting that it can solve. But at some point, um, 
the small child that goes through a developmental, you know, epiphany, it gets a little bit better, a little bit smarter, its brain's a little bit more wrinkled, and suddenly it will see a pattern. It'll start to recognize the shapes. And then suddenly the child can do the exercise and complete the toy more rapidly. And then pretty quickly, the child loses interest and goes on to the next challenge. Well, your situation is kind of like that small child. Um, at first, you have, will see no patterns. It's just trial and error and uh, why it works one time and you have to start over and doesn't work another time will be a mystery to you. But the more you do it, I'd say around 100 times will get you there. Once you've done it about 100 times, suddenly you will start to see, oh, this problem is like this one. Oh, this one is following kind of like a little series of steps that's similar to that one. You'll start to recognize patterns and it will become more fluid for you, more uh, easier for you to do. And at some point, you won't regard it as a challenge at all. It will just be something you do habitually. Life's like that, right? You learn how to do things and you get better at it. Before you know it, you think it's easy. Now, when we're doing it, again, no hard and fast rules, but if you're starting with something simple uh, or starting with something complicated, your first move is always, well, how many atoms? How many atoms of each thing do you have on both sides of the equation? So let's revisit that uh, equation for the formation of water. You know, again, we have a certain unknown number of hydrogens and oxygens that are supposed to form water. And it should be obvious that this is an unbalanced equation because, you know, two oxygens on the reactant side, O2, but only one oxygen on the product water uh, on, the, on the other side. So what to do? Well, if the equation is simple, it really doesn't matter. Uh, start anywhere you like. Uh, it should be obvious that, that you have a limited number of things you can do and you'll tinker with it. And it probably won't matter which one you start first. But if you like, we can start with, you know, the oxygen. And we got two on one side and the other side's got, you know, one, so it's not equal. So got to get them equal. Well, I'll, I'll put a two in front of the one. I'll change the one into two by putting a two in front of it. Now it's balanced. Yay. But we're not done. Okay. Because now that we did that, now we see that the hydrogens are unbalanced. Now it's kind of irritating. You got to go back the opposite direction, but it's pretty obvious what you're going to do here. The two hydrogens on the reactant side, you got to get them up so that you have the same uh, as the four oxygens on the product side. So once again, you put in a two, and now everything is balanced. So if an equation is simple, it will probably be easy what to do, and you'll just do it. Now, if an equation is complex, you know, it's not that simple, well, there's no guaranteed way to do it. But a good rule of thumb that works most of the time is Try to start with the biggest thing and the biggest thing. What do I mean by that? Well, look at the substances. Count the atoms. Some of them are likely to have more atoms than others. Whichever one has the biggest atoms, most number of atoms, that would be a good place to start. And if you were going to start uh, with the biggest thing and the biggest thing, you would choose not only the molecule that had the most atoms, but you'd say, okay, which, which atom is most numerous in this molecule? So in this example, uh, H2 and O2 are both two atoms in size, but H2O is three. And there's more hydrogens in that water than oxygen. So I'll start with the hydrogens in the water and see what happens. And a lot of times if you just use that rule of thumb, start with the biggest thing and the biggest thing, things will unfold as they need to unfold. So here we have some examples and I've given them to students and uh, you know, uh, these different types, these aren't all the possible types of balancing equations you could get. But the more you do them, the better you'll get at them. So time to start practicing now.